when the Reformation threatened the power of the Catholic Church and drew millions of people away from its clutches, Satan established a counter-Reformation designed to nullify the threat and reassert its position of dominance. At the Council of Trent from 1545 to 1563, a commission of cardinals was put together to clean up the Catholic Church and to reassert its position of authority as the only true Church of God. Fundamental to this movement was the establishment of new religious orders. The most famous order to be created at this time, and the one that has gone on to become the largest in the world, was the Society of Jesus, or as they are more commonly known, the Jesuits. They would become one of the most infamous organisations in history. It's important we explore the Jesuits because it gives us deep insight into the mind and tactics of our enemy, but for that same reason I want to preface it with a warning that the next few parts will be dealing with some very twisted and evil themes. The founder of the Jesuits was a man called Don Inigo Lopez, who was born into an extremely wealthy family in the Basque region of Spain in 1491. He later changed his name to Ignatius Loyola. As a young man, Loyola was said by police records to be proud, violent, vindictive and dangerous. His great life's ambition was to become a powerful military commander, which was going well until one particular battle where a cannonball broke one of his legs and heavily wounded the other. This event effectively ended his military ambitions. He was removed from the field of battle, underwent numerous painful surgical operations and spent a long time in recovery. During this period, Loyola had a nervous breakdown as he struggled to come to terms with the end of his army career and the end of his life's ambition. In this fragile mental state, as he lay there with little else to occupy his mind, he began reading a number of fanciful religious texts about the works of the Catholic saints. Particularly inspired by the life of St Francis of Assisi, he set out to emulate his deeds and those of others like him. He began to envision Jesus as a type of great military commander, and thought that although his physical army career was over, he could instead become a kind of general in Jesus' army instead, the goal of which would be to capture the world. Now as a cripple, he made his way across Spain to the mountains of Montserrat, where there was a Benedictine monastery. Within this monastery was a sacred goddess idol called the Black Virgin of Montserrat, which he stood before in vigil for three days. There he committed himself and his work to her, by doing so, he committed himself to the demonic goddess Asherah. From here, he decided that he would go to Jerusalem and conquer the Muslim world for Catholicism. His ambitions were halted, however, as Barcelona had the plague and he was forced to stay in the small town of Manresa for ten months instead. For those ten months, he lived in a cave, torturing himself physically and mentally until he began to have dreams and visions. Through these hallucinations, he claimed that the secret doctrine of the Catholic Church was taught to him by a form in the air near him, and this form gave him much consolation because it was exceedingly beautiful. It somehow seemed to have the shape of a serpent and had many things that shone like eyes, but were not eyes. He received much delight and consolation from gazing upon this object, but when the object vanished, he became disconsolate. Here we see the telltale signs of a demonic cave revelation, exactly like that which Muhammad experienced. More explicitly than Muhammad's encounter, the being came in the form of a serpent rather than an angel of light. Similar to Muhammad, Loyola found himself prone to depression after contact. After the ten-month period in the cave, Loyola proceeded to Jerusalem, where he approached the Franciscan monks. They told him to go home as they did not want any political trouble. It was upon his return to Spain that he started formal training by studying theology at various universities. At this time he, along with a small band of companions, also started making disciples of others. While Loyola preached, it was noted that some of his female followers became so hysterically zealous that one fell senseless, another sometimes rolled about in the ground, another had been seen in the grip of convulsions or shuddering and sweating in anguish. Clearly demonic activity was at work following his cave experience and commitment to the demonic Asherah idol, and for the rest of his life he was known for having mystic powers. In the coming years he would be thrown into jail twice under the suspicion that he was a member of the Almbrado, or as we know them, the Illuminati, and we'll discover more about them later. The description of people falling senseless and going into convulsions may remind you of scenes from Christian churches in recent times. 
To deal with that, I want to refer you to a three-part series called Kundalini Warning, which I'll provide links for below. Please watch all the way to the end for a balanced opinion. By 1534, Ignatius Loyola had six key companions, all of whom he had met at university, and they formed the initial military brotherhood of the Society of Jesus. On the morning of 15th of August, 1534, they met in the crypt of the Church of Our Lady of the Martyrs at Montmartre and took solemn vows committing themselves to their lifelong work. As a man with an army background, Loyola created his order with the principles and disciplines that he had been used to as a soldier. The leader demanded the unquestioning obedience from his inferiors. Loyola was made the first superior general of the order, and they began the work of opposing the Reformation and re-establishing the dominance of the Catholic Church in Europe and around the world. They made their way to Rome where, in time, their society was accepted by the Pope, who at that time was Paul III. Paul III had seen the need of such a military order to repel the progress that the Protestant Reformation was making, as the Catholic Church seemed powerless by its own means. The Pope invested in them the authority too. Excommunicate all who would hinder or who do not aid the society, to confer orders, preach and administer the sacraments, to change their general, to absolve heretics as well as imprison the excommunicate, to exercise episcopal functions, to confirm, exercise, dispense, etc., to disguise themselves, to carry movable altars, give plenary indulgences, to live exempt, free from secular powers, taxes as well as jurisdiction, authority, sentence and command of any other ordinary delegate, judge magistrate from any search. In other words, the Jesuits were given authority from the Catholic Church to operate above the law and to employ any means necessary to do their work. With this remit, in time, the Jesuits became the most prominent and powerful of Catholic weapons against the Reformation.